If you have a copy of God's Word, please turn uh, to two passages. The first is in Isaiah 53, and the second is in the epistle of 1 Peter. We've been in a series of sermons. Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2. I'd like to read Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6, and then pray, and then we'll read 1 Peter 2, verses 24 and 25. Please follow along as I read Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray together. Father, now we come before your word. We pray that you would come and that you would help us, that you would minister to us, and that you would do this for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you would now, flip over to 1 Peter 2, but keep a finger in Isaiah 53, because we'll look at it again. This whole sermon, you need to be in both texts, okay? Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2. Let me read now 1 Peter 2, verses 24 and 25. Peter writes, he, that is Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. One of our values as a church family, one of our core values, it might be said, Uh, is the value of meaningful membership, meaningful church membership. Uh, So we seek to promote among our church body, among our church family, and certainly anyone who would wish to become a member in this church, a meaningful view of membership. And part of that means certainly that uh, it's not just uh, occasional attendance or sort of hanging on in the peripheries of the church. We want people meaningfully engaged and involved in the life of the church. And certainly, at the very least, what meaningful membership would entail is the idea of what we might call regenerate church membership. And that is the idea we believe, according to the Scripture, that all those who do join the church should be able to profess with their mouth and show evidence by virtue of a transformed life that they have been born again by the Spirit of God and that they have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. And so, some of you here today are going to be in our new members class this afternoon, And uh, we'll go over some of these things together, and as part of that process, we have these two classes where we seek to explain the gospel and explain the core doctrines that we believe as a church. Uh, But before anyone would join the church, we ask that they submit to what we call a membership interview. And that is where incoming members meet with at least one, but sometimes all three of the elders. And uh, we just want to hear their testimony, how they came to faith in Christ. We want to talk to them about membership. And one of the questions we almost always ask, so those of you who are thinking of joining the church, I'm giving you a bit of a cheat sheet here, uh, we ask the question, what is the gospel? We certainly want to hear your narrative of how it is that you came to faith in Christ and how the Lord drew you to himself, but we almost always ask that question, what is the gospel? Because, of course, we believe no one is saved apart from faith in the gospel, the good news of what God has done in Christ to make a way of salvation for sinners. Now, it's, it's somewhat humorous at times uh, 
um, maybe because we're a Reformed church or something like that, people can get a little nervous by that question, and they think they need to give a very highly intellectual or nuanced answer or something like that, and you throw in words like propitiation or, or what have you. Uh, but we believe, of course, the gospel is so simple, so fundamental, that even the smallest child can understand it. And so we're not looking, of course, for complexity. We're looking actually for simplicity. And if I detect in the membership interview that the individual is struggling for one reason or another to articulate the gospel, I'll ask this more narrow and more pointed question. And that question is, what does the death of Jesus have to do with your sin? What does the death of Jesus have to do with your sin? Of all the answers we might give to that question, perhaps the best answer provided for us in the Bible is contained in our text this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. First part of that verse. What does the death of Jesus have to do with your sin, Christian? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. In this sermon, I hope to explain the next 40 minutes or so as briefly, as clearly, as cogently as possible, the relationship between the death of Jesus and the sins of those he came to save. And I want to do it through our passage this morning, which is in many ways an epitome text, a kind of text that just rises above the context in some ways. Certainly it is situated in the context, but it's such an extraordinary text in that it, in very short compass, in concise and muscular language, conveys one of the most fundamental truths in all the Bible related to the atonement, the cross work of Jesus Christ. So we'll open up this passage, verses 24 and 25, under two main headings. We'll consider first, death for sin, and secondly, death to sin. Death for sin, death to sin. Look again, let's read verses 24 and 25 as we consider that first point, death for sin. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's mainly that first phrase, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, in order to expound the phrase in verse 24, that first phrase, it might help for us to ask two preliminary questions. First of all, let's ask the very fundamental question, why did the Son of God come into the world in human flesh? Have you ever wondered that? Uh, maybe you Sunday school children, perhaps your Sunday school teachers ask you this question, or they'll begin asking you this question as we resume gathering next Sunday. Why did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come into the world in human flesh? How would you answer that question? The best answer the Bible gives is that he came ultimately to die and to rise again. Now, if you read the gospel accounts, there's all sorts of things that Jesus did. He came to reveal the Father. He came to give his many teachings. He came to call his disciples. But the main work, the core work that Jesus did coming into the world in human flesh was to die and to rise again. But this leads to a second question. Why did Jesus have to die? Why was it necessary that Jesus come and die and rise again in the first place? Two answers we should give. First of all, because those he came to save were sinners. The very ones Jesus came to save, to redeem, and to put in right relationship with God through reconciliation that he would make, those he came to save, like you and me, were sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 makes this plain. This is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But we've still not yet answered the question. Why, if it was Jesus' mission, the mission of the Father in sending His Son, why, if it was His mission to save sinners, why was it necessary for Him to die? And the answer is, Jesus had to die because the forgiveness of sins requires payment, requires what we call atonement, a sacrifice for sin, requires the shedding of blood. Hebrews 9.22 makes this plain. Without the shedding of blood, 
there is no forgiveness of sins. That's what was pictured, what was typified, what was symbolized in those sacrifices under the Old Testament. Why were the lambs and the goats and the bulls sacrificed? Why was their blood shed? It was foreshadowing what Jesus would do in shedding His own blood to make atonement for the sins of His people because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So it is the reality of sin that we are sinners and the fact that the forgiveness of sins requires the shedding of blood that moved the Son of God to come in human flesh and to shed His blood for us. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world in human flesh in order to die for those He came to save. And He died to make atonement for their sins so that they might be forgiven. So now looking at our text, we can better understand what's said in verse 24. In language that is altogether clear and explicit. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree or on the cross. Just a remarkable statement. What is conveyed, just a few short words. How does my sin as a believer, how does my sin relate to the death of Jesus? The idea is that all of the sins of God's elect were transferred onto Jesus. They were imputed to Jesus. He bore our sins, the text says, in His body, all of our sins. Our sins of hatred and greed, of lust and murder, of idolatry and sexual immorality, of anger and pride and selfishness and impatience and drunkenness and covetousness. These sins of thought, word, and deed were transferred into the body of Jesus such that as He suffered on the cross, and as God the Father unleashed His wrath on the body of Jesus, the punishment due to our sins was exacted, was spent on Him because He bore our sins in His body on the tree. When we see God's wrath unleashed upon the body of Jesus at the cross, we should see God's wrath unleashed on our sins, we who believe on Him which He bore in His body on the tree. At the cross, every Christian should see, should see Jesus in my place. Jesus suffering the punishment that my sins deserved. My sins in His body. His blood shed on my account. Now this was, of course, foretold of the Messiah of the Christ. That He would come and that He would be the great sin bearer for His people. So now turn back to Isaiah 53. I want us to look again at verses 4 through 6. They're in Isaiah 53 foretelling of the coming suffering servant, the coming Messiah. We read this, verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Look down at verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Chastisement was laid upon him. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look down at verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. And what a load it was to bear. All my sins laid on Jesus. Not just the respectable sins, and not just the top ten. All my sins laid on Jesus, my substitute. And not just all my sins, but the sins of all those whom Jesus came to save. Indeed, all of God's elect, all those who would turn from sin and believe upon Christ, all placed upon Jesus, our substitute. And so if you're a Christian here this morning, if you have repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ, these things are true of you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has bore your griefs. He's carried your sorrows, all the grief and sorrow brought about by sin. He bore it for you. He was pierced for your transgressions, and He was crushed for your iniquities as He bore your sins in His body 
on the tree. Brother, sister, let the roots of that doctrine, that idea, sink deep down into your soul. Let it mold and shape the inner psychology of your spiritual life. That my sins, all my sins, all that would make me ashamed and would invite the just wrath of God have been laid on Jesus such that as Isaiah 53 says, I'm accounted righteous. He bore my sins in his body on the tree. All my sins for which I am rightly ashamed have been borne by Jesus Christ and have thereby been removed from me. Next time Satan, whose name means the accuser, the adversary, next time he comes to you and he tells you, Christian, you're a wretched sinner, you're a vile sinner, you have no hope of salvation, you say back to him, that's not news to me. Tell me something I don't know. That has never been in doubt. That has never been contested. I know I'm a vile, wretched sinner, but this I know. Jesus Christ bore my sins in his body on the tree. That's what silences the accuser. That's what silences the adversary. The sure hope, the sure confidence that my griefs and sorrows and iniquities have been laid on the Son of God and that in his body on the tree he absorbed the wrath of God in my place so that I will never suffer for my sins. I think of this sometimes as we're singing songs. We project the songs on the projector screen. And you see the projector screen now, it's white, there's nothing on it. And I think, what if someone could bring in a flash drive with the slides of all my sins on it, hook it up to the computer, and just play it for all to see? Could you imagine that your sins displayed for all to see, to sin after sin after sin? And I don't know if the analogy works, but it's, it's like what God has done is he has taken that flash drive and he's plugged it into Jesus and he's uploaded and imputed my sins into his body and then he smashed the hard drive such that I will never be held to account for my sins. The justice and wrath of God has been satisfied in Jesus Christ because he bore my sins in his body on the tree. Do you remember there was an evangelist, an apologist, maybe he's still doing his thing, his name's Ray Comfort. And uh, he would ask people this question, he'd go out to them on the street and he'd say, if you died tonight and you appeared before God, um, and he asked you, why should I allow you to enter my heaven, what would you say? What would you say? Children, what would you say? If you stood before the Lord today and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? There's nothing more for a Christian to say than that he bore my sins in his body on the tree. It's nothing I've done. It's, it's nothing within me that grants me access to heaven. It is only what Jesus has done as my sin-bearing sacrifice, bearing the wrath of God in my place. Because he has shed his blood for me, my sins are forgiven. And we must insist, by the way, that without the shedding of his blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. It is precisely because he shed his blood that my sins are forgiven. Now, this is a very important point. Very important point. There are many out there in our day who would dilute Christ's atonement on the cross by voiding it of its necessity and by arguing that we really shouldn't think of it as an atonement at all. We shouldn't think in terms of propitiation or the satisfaction of God's wrath or the requirement of blood as atonement for sin. Rather, they would argue, we should see in the cross this sort of over-the-top, overwhelming display of God's love, a performance of the love of God, by no means necessary, but he was just, he was going above and beyond and displaying this, this sacrifice for others. But we shouldn't think of it as an atonement, as a payment for sin. That's too vulgar an idea. That's too inappropriate an idea. Well, listen, there's no doubt that Jesus' death on the cross was an extreme, the extreme, the ultimate expression of love. But there is more happening at the cross than just an expression of love. 
Friends, actual atonement took place at the cross. Actual payment for actual sin took place. This text and a hundred others makes painstakingly clear that Jesus at the cross was satisfying the wrath of God for us. Make no mistake, this is exactly what's going on at the cross. Jesus bearing our sins and being sacrificed in our place and suffering the wrath of God that was due to our sins. I think I've told this story before, but uh, there's that hymn, we sing it often, uh, In Christ Alone. Uh, Recently, there was some article that called it the hymn of a generation or something like that. Almost every church sings that song. There was a particular liberal denomination that wanted the rights to sing that song, but they found one line in particular intolerable. It is that line, till on the cross as Jesus died, what? The wrath of God was satisfied. And that idea that Jesus would somehow be absorbing the wrath of God, that's, that's an intolerable notion. And they asked if they could change the line to, till on the cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. And God bless Keith and Kristen Getty, they said no. Because to them that represented a dilution of what it was Jesus was doing at the cross. And more than that, the notion of God's love is void of just about any meaning if Jesus does not suffer God's wrath in my place. It is precisely in His suffering God's wrath on my account. It is precisely in His bearing of my sins and shedding His blood on my account. Therein is found the love of God. It is at the cross that justice and love meet. God is seen to be perfectly just, and God is seen to be perfectly loving in that He secured the salvation of His people, the forgiveness of their sins through the sin-bearing of His Son, who He sacrifices, who He crushes, as Isaiah says, in our place, and there love and justice kiss. I'll just say this as an aside. In a generation that is particularly passionate about justice, We should think long and hard before we try to void the Christian faith of the doctrine of the atonement and the doctrine of hell. Those two doctrines assure us that all wrongs will be righted, either at the cross or in hell forever. What we see at the cross is that for sinners like us who want to enjoy the forgiveness of God, the love of God, it is precisely at the cross where His justice and His love are on display. So every time you think of Jesus on that cross, Christian, you should think, my sins are on those shoulders. My sins are in that body as the Father pours out the cup of His wrath full stop upon His Son. It was the will of the Lord to crush Him so that the power and guilt of sin in your life must be undone. We cannot give up the necessity of His atonement. My life is bound up in His atonement. I need my sins to be born in His body on the tree. The forgiveness of my sins depends on His atonement. By His wounds, I have my healing. And that's what Peter says next at the end of verse 24. By His wounds, you have been healed. Quoting again from Isaiah 53 and verse 5. You ever think of that phrase? By his wounds you have been healed. It's a striking image. Think of the wounds of Jesus. The nails being driven into his wrists. That in those wounds, I find my healing. I find my life. The nails driven into his feet and into his side. The crown of thorns crashed on his head. The blood he shed for me. As he dies, I have life pumped into my lungs. By his wounds, you have been healed. What is the relationship between Jesus and my sins? To the sinner in need of grace, of redemption, what a mercy it is to be able to say, he himself bore my sins in his body on the tree. This is at the heart of what we call the gospel, that through the atonement God has made in the death of his son, sinners are saved and their sins are carried away. But there's more. That was death for sin. Jesus dies, he bears our sins, he dies for sin. Secondly, consider with me death 
to sin, death to sin. What outcome does the death of Jesus for our sins bring about in terms of our relationship to sin? That's where Peter goes next. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Why did Jesus bear our sins? So that, in order that, hina, we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For what purpose did Jesus die for us? What does his accomplishment of our redemption mean for our lives now? What is his work wrought within us? We read, Jesus died for us so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Which means as those born again and united to Christ, our death to sin is implicated in his death for sin. I'll say that again. As those born again and united to Christ, our death to sin is implicated in his death for sin. He dies for sin so that we might die to sin, and it is through our union with him in his death that we too die. Now lock in here. This is a very important point. When the Bible speaks of our union with Christ, it will most often speak of us dying with Jesus and rising with Jesus. We're looking at death to sin right now. When the Bible says that we die to sin as believers, it's helpful to think of that in two ways. We can think of it and should think of it, first of all, objectively, and we should think of it, secondly, subjectively or experientially. So the Bible says we're to die to sin. We have died to sin. What would that mean objectively? It would mean that through our union with Christ, through being born again, having our sins forgiven and being attached to Jesus, the Bible says we are reckoned dead to sin. As Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says we too have died. It is an accomplished objective fact. Regardless of what you did on your way over here today, if you're a Christian, it does not change the fact that objectively you are dead to sin. Now, what does it mean then subjectively to die to sin or experientially to die to sin? Well, it means that in my experience, in my life, I'm seeking to live out my union with Christ, to live out the objective reality that I am dead to sin by God's help, by God's grace, putting my sin in my experience, in my day-to-day life, to death. You see, objectively dead to sin, subjectively we die to sin, day by day in our experience, seeking to live out what is objectively true, which means, if you're paying close attention, at times your subjective behavior can be out of whack, out of line with what is objectively true of you, if you're a Christian. Okay, so you might think of a married couple. John and Jane are married, objectively so. They have a marriage license filed at the clerk's office. They have rings. They give vows to each other. They are married objectively. But John and Jane have a particularly bitter and unhappy fight, and they decide that they're going to separate for the night. He's going to stay in a hotel. She's going to stay at the house. Are they objectively married? Why, yes, they are. They're married. But in their experience, subjectively, are they living out that reality of their marriage as they're sleeping in separate beds? No, subjectively, experientially, they're not living as they ought. They're not living in line with the reality, the objective reality that they are, in fact, married. That is, in some ways, it's not a perfect illustration, but in some ways, that dialogue between objective and subjective. So now I want to ask you to turn to Romans 6, okay? Stay locked in. Keep tracking with me. I think this will hopefully cement the idea in our minds. In Romans 6, Paul talks about our union with Christ, and he's going to talk about what it means that we have died to sin and that we, we live to righteousness, as Peter puts it in our passage. And he's going to talk about objective dying to sin and how that works itself out subjectively in the life of the believer. So Romans 6, follow along as I read or listen as I read. Romans 6, verse 1. Here's the objective death to sin. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How could we who died to sin still live in it? 
We are the ones, through Christ, who died to sin, objectively. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Objective. This is true of you, Christian. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For we who have died, excuse me, for one who has died has been set free from sin. So Christian, it is true of you in objective realms that you have been set free from sin. But now look how Paul shifts to the subjective, how this is lived out in our Christian experience. Verse 11. So you, Christian, also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Husband, go home to your wife and be married as you are. Live out your union with Christ, he's saying. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Christian, you are dead to sin, and now Paul says, live like it. Bring your subjective behavior in conformity with the objective things that are true of you. Now back in our text in 1 Peter 2, which one does Peter have in mind when he says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin? Is it objective or subjective? It's both. It's both. Through our union with Jesus, we are reckoned to be dead to sin. But there's also implied in this statement from Peter the exhortation that daily, as he has already said, we should be putting off, separating ourselves from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. We are to put to death our sins, no longer letting sin have its way with us. That old man, that principle of sin that we still find in ourselves, we're to push him down. We're to mortify our sins. The Lord Jesus bore our sins, died for our sins, so that we would no longer live in sin, so that we would die to sin. And just as we are united with him in his death, so we are united to him, Peter says, in his resurrection. We die to sin, we live to righteousness. Christ bore our sins in his body on the tree, not only so that we would die to sin, that we would mortify our sin, but that we would live to righteousness, or live for righteousness, or unto righteousness. Now, we should not understand this righteousness to be the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. That's not the idea at all in these verses. This refers to our living out and practicing righteousness, as in good deeds of godliness and righteousness and goodness in the world. When we see in verse 24 that we're to live for righteousness, we're to understand that Peter is saying we're to live to do good. We're to live out our lives according to righteous principles. We're to live according to moral virtue. And one of the reasons I say that is because the word righteousness, the Greek word that's used, is only used one other time in 1 Peter. And that's in 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to turn the page over or glance over at the next page. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the word righteousness is again used in verse 13. And it comes on the heels of Peter exhorting these Christians to engage in good deeds, to do good, to be known for their good behavior. There in 1 Peter 3.13 we read, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. You see what Peter did there? He equated doing good with suffering for righteousness' sake. Who is there to harm you? If you're zealous for what is good. But even if you should suffer for, you would think you'd say, doing good. When he said he says, for righteousness sake. I believe he's equating those two ideas. In this context, in the context of 1 
Peter 2 and 3, to live for righteousness is to live for doing good, to live for service to Christ, to live out the moral virtues and the moral ethics that Christ has called us to, to live for righteousness. So now we can ask, what was Christ achieving for you and in you when he bore your sins in his body on the tree? This was his purpose, Peter says. You might die to sin, putting your sin to death, mortifying your sin, and that you might live to righteousness, live to do good. Why did Jesus die? One of the reasons he died, apart from bearing our sins, making atonement for us, one of the reasons he died is so that I would, by his grace, mortify my sin and do good all the days of my life that I would live a righteous life devoted to serving him in good deeds. And listen to me, that is not somehow a sub-gospel idea or something that mitigates against the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That's not a legalistic notion to say one of the reasons Jesus saved me is so that I would live a righteous and holy life. You recognize that, Christian. We've seen this again and again. We saw it in our series on Titus. And Peter has already begun to make this point. He's going to make it again and again in 1 Peter. Christians live to do good. They live for righteousness. They're known for their godly conduct. One of the reasons Jesus shed his blood for you is so that you would live to righteousness. Or as Paul said in Titus 2 verse 14, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. He doesn't want us to live in lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. He wants us to be zealous for righteousness, zealous for good deeds. This means, brothers and sisters, that to mortify sin, to live to righteousness, to do good is to realize the very purpose for which Christ died for you and me. Friends, Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, calls us to put our sin to death, to no longer live to sin, but to die to sin, and to live for righteousness. And what more powerful and wonderful motivation can we have than that the very one who shed his blood on our account calls us to this. And he tells us this invites his smile, this meets with his approval, that we would die to sin and live to righteousness. In closing, let me now ask this question. We've seen Jesus' death for sin, and we've talked about our death to sin, What is the outcome of all of this? What does Peter understand to be the outcome? How does he describe the new situation we're in as those who have had our sins borne by Jesus and those who have ourselves died to sin and who live to righteousness? Verse 25, you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's how Peter describes it. Very much, again, drawing, I think, from the language of Isaiah 53, where we read in verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Peter says, we were straying. You were straying. And my brother, my sister, you would have strayed to hell had he not stopped you. And had he not brought you back to the fold and turned you around. We know this, right? If you're a Christian, you understand this. You must know this. That I was like a lost and wandering sheep. I wasn't looking for Jesus. I wasn't trying to find my way to the fold. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. He didn't meet me halfway. He didn't ask me to do my best and then let him do the rest. He didn't say, I will help those who will help themselves. He said, come to me. I can put you on my shoulders, and I will bear you safely home, and I will bring you back to the fold. He interposed his blood. He pursued the wandering sheep, and he brought us back to the fold, home rejoicing to make us part of his flock to know him as the great shepherd and overseer of our souls. And that's the language that Peter uses. That's how Peter refers to him. You have been 
returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The Greek word for shepherd is, shepherd is poimen. It means pastor, pastor or shepherd. Do you think of Jesus as your pastor? You should. Jesus has said in a number of places to be our pastor, and he is the truest of pastors. The word for overseer is episkopos, from which we get our word episcopalian. It most naturally means bishop. Now, in Baptist circles, we don't use that word. We don't refer to our pastors as bishops. Wouldn't be wrong to, but we just don't as a matter of history. But if you were to be in the Episcopalian church, there is a complex hierarchy of bishops, and the top bishop is referred to as the archbishop. Peter is saying Jesus is our archbishop. He's the true bishop. He's the true and greatest and ultimate overseer of our souls. What a beautiful thing to say then to sheep who were straying, that we have been brought back to the shepherd, to the pastor, and the bishop of our souls. He is the truest of pastors. He is the greatest of bishops. And what is emphasized here is his place in our lives as our ultimate authority, as our ultimate overseer, the one to whom we will give an account, the one whom we must follow, and the one who leads us as the shepherd and overseer of our souls. So in conclusion, if you're a Christian, what is the relationship between the death of Jesus and your sins? It is this, that Jesus bore my sins in his body on the tree. Jesus died in my place. He suffered the punishment that my sins deserve so that I never will. He saved me. And more than that, he has so united me to himself that in his death for sin, I too die to sin and live for righteousness. Now, if you're outside of Christ, you're not a Christian, you've not repented of your sins and believed on him. What can be said about your sin? Well, my friend, you will bear your sin. And your sin will bring about your ruin. Your sin will lead you all the way to hell and you'll be damned forever. Which is a harrowing prospect. But what could be more terrifying than to actually answer for your sins to a just and holy God? You will bear your sins. But there exists no good reason why anyone here should meet with that fate. Not when such a provision has been offered in Jesus Christ. Not when there is offered to you a substitute who is willing to bear your sins in his body on the tree. God has furnished us with a sacrifice. God has made provision for sinners so that they would not stand in his presence with naught but their sin to commend them to God. He has provided his own son, born in human flesh, who went to the cross to die for the sins of his people. There just is no reason why anyone here under the sound of my voice or watching online or listening to this recording at some later date, there's no reason why anyone here should stand on the day of judgment in only their sins. Not when a substitute has been offered. The reality of 1 Peter 2 and verse 24 can be yours today. If you would turn from your sins and believe upon Jesus Christ, you can testify, you can confess with your mouth in truth that he himself, I know this to be true, he has borne my sins in his body on the tree. And if that is your profession, you can say that before the people of God in the waters of baptism, that I know that I am united to Jesus in his death. And I am symbolizing that by being buried under the water and being raised out, that I've been united to Jesus, and I've died with him to sin, and I've been raised to righteousness and to newness of life through his resurrection. That can be the possession 
and the reality of every soul here. It can be that for you if you're five years old. It can be that for you if you're 85 years old and you've lived a life full of sin. Could you imagine being the thief on the cross, looking sideways at Jesus, recognizing that he's a sinner, and believing that he is the Christ, and that he's suffering not for what he deserves, but suffering for what he, the thief on the cross, deserves. And to hear those words from Jesus, this day you will be with me in paradise. Here is the body of Jesus. And that thief was permitted to know that Jesus was bearing his sins in his body on the tree. Well, you can know that today if you would come to Jesus in repentance and faith. May the Lord bring this word home to all of our hearts. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we say your words back to you. Why should any of us die when there is atonement made in Jesus? We pray, Father, that for all of those who are in Christ, who know ourselves to be your children, that you would, in the sweetest and most convincing way, impress this on our minds and our hearts, and may it shape who we are and how we think and how we live that our Savior Jesus Christ has borne our sins in His body on the tree, that like that, that goat in the Old Covenant who your priest Aaron laid his hands on, where the sins of the people were transferred into the goat and the goat was driven out, so our sins are removed from us, even as far as the east is from the west. May that shape the way we think and the way we pray and the way we live. And may you so work in us and help us by your Spirit through the new birth, to live as those who are dead to sin, to live for righteousness, and to live as the sheep who have been brought back to the fold, to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Please, 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 Father, so work as to open the eyes of the blind here, those who are not yet yours. Persuade them, show them their sin, show them in mercy, where their sin would lead them. So move in them to embrace the provision and the substitute made in your Son, the Lord Jesus. Do this for their good, for their salvation, for their joy, and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.